Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Wola here. Uh, thanks for joining me on tonight's webinar. I know this is an important topic, a topic that many people ask me about when I'm consulting with them, you know, either in private or through the uh, you know, online programs that I have. A lot of people are interested in hyperbaric oxygen therapy and the benefits that can be seen from that. So this whole presentation is really on that topic. You know, really trying to understand the science, you know, the clinical application, and really the significance of what can come about from what I consider to be a very important treatment in the biomedical approach to autism. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> from time to time, I will, uh, sometimes I need to clear my throat or drink some water here. You can just read through this real quickly, and then we'll move on. Okay, first off, if you've attended my webinars in the past, you know what a big fan I am of educational material and how important I feel it is for you as parents and if there's physicians and healthcare practitioners out there to be educated about a variety of things with respect to biomedicine for autism, um, not just hyperbaric oxygen therapy, but all the things with respect to diet and methylation support and supplements and digestive function, etc. So I'm just going to list a few things that I think are really important for you as a parent that you should have in your library. Book on the right, Biological Treatments for Autism and PDD, was one of the first books that I read many, many years ago. This is actually a newer edition. And this is a book from Dr. Shaw from Great Plains. Excellent information, uh, very good descriptions of what can happen with yeast overgrowth, bacterial problems, gut problems, the science behind the gluten casein-free diet, etc. So. Make sure if you don't have that book, pick it up, keep it in your library. It's worth reading. The book on the left I like too, uh, Effective Biomedical Treatments by Dr. Pangborn and Baker. This is really more of a reference book. It's not something that you would typically read from cover to cover, but there's a tremendous amount of information in there that you can go and reference as needed when things come up with respect to your child's treatment. So both of these are very valuable. Dr. Shaw also released... Well, this book has been out a couple years now called Autism Beyond the Basics. And I have a chapter in this book. There's also a book in here by Dr. Rosengall about hyperbaric oxygen therapy, a very good chapter on inflammatory bowel disease and autism. So, again, another worth, worthwhile thing to have in your library if you don't have this particular book. And then I have a lot of online sites uh, as well. One, this is a, a free blog site. This is video blogs where I record videos. They're transcribed into articles and then loaded on this site at autismrecoverytreatment.com. So you can reference a lot of different things from you know dietary intervention to hyperbaric oxygen therapy to methyl B12 to microglia activation and neural inflammation. So um, you'll generally find it on this site. And if it's not there, then you can always shoot me an email and say, hey doc, uh, would you mind creating a video on a particular topic? I'm always looking for ideas for short videos to, to talk about. I also have a very interactive um, uh, subscription website. This is autismactionplan.com. And this is a place that you can access me on a daily basis if you choose, during the day, evenings, weekends, holidays. And this is a place that is really a place to exchange information and share information with me with respect to your child. You might have a doctor that you're working with um, that you just want to get a second opinion on or another way of looking at things. Or maybe you're doing this on your own. You just want a doctor that you can reach out to uh, to give some, some feedback on. So this is a great website for that, autismactionplan.com. And I also have an informational uh, website for supplements. Um, the world of supplements is always expanding, and this is a website that I created a, probably a couple of years ago to really kind of give an idea about what are some of the supplements used for. And what I did is I created videos for them. Um, not every supplement, but the majority of supplements that I tend to use in my practice, giving you some clinical tips, why the supplements you use, how it's dosed, etc. cetera. Um, and so this is a, a useful site. And again, this is free information on this site as well. 
And then I have a service where I do lab reviews. So if your child has Great Plains labs that you've done, or maybe you've done some labs from other, uh, done some testing from other labs, and you really would like a professional to look at them and interpret them, well, that's what this service is about. So you can pick from a menu of different tests and through this website have those labs sent to me. And I'll sit down with my camera and I'll have the labs in front of me and I'll do a personal individualized lab review for your child and give my interpretation, what the markers mean, which ones are significant, which ones are not significant, and then general feedback with respect to treatment. So this is a kind of a cool service that uh, really sort of answers some of those questions you might have with respect to your child's lab. All right, so let's get into our presentation here. The, um, what we're going to talk about is what is hyperbaric oxygen therapy? What types of conditions can be commonly used for? You know, how it's done, what are some of the different types of HBOT therapy? Is it dangerous, et cetera, various protocols? And then we're going to end up talking about what are the benefits, pros and cons of an in-home program versus a clinic-based program for hyperbaric. By the way, with, uh, with respect to my presentations, I don't do a Q&A at the end. There's just so much information I present. Um, but if you do happen to post a question, those questions are, are, are sequestered from uh, Great Plains, and then they forward those to me. We usually within a, you know, three, four days, and I can answer them uh, via email and then send back to them. So um, this presentation is really just going through what we see here. Uh, but again, if you do happen to post a question, I, uh, I will get it. All right, so what is HBOT? All right, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is the process of receiving increased oxygen concentration through what's called a pressure chamber, which would be our hyperbaric chamber. And that increased pressure allows for more oxygen to essentially permeate the fluids of the body, the plasma, the lymph fluid, the interstitial fluid between the cells, the cerebral spinal fluid, and the cellular fluid as well, okay? And the whole goal is that we're trying to increase the oxygen capacity in the body to improve metabolic activity. And an example would be, you know, what happens with a carbonated beverage, all right? You've got CO2, carbon dioxide, basically pressurized inside a can, uh, and that pressure effect is increasing the overall concentration within that carbonated beverage. The same principle applies with a hyperbaric chamber. You're pressurizing the oxygen to increase the concentration within the body. Now, when we talk about hyperbaric, we're also talking about things called partial pressure. And partial pressure is the pressure or the tension that each gas would have if essentially it was alone um, occupied in a certain volume of space. So for example, oxygen at sea level is about 21%. Um, of atmospheric gas um, <clears throat> at sea level, essentially. And what happens is, is that the partial pressure of gas is essentially a measure of that gas's molecular thermodynamic activity. So <clears throat> a gas will always flow from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. Um, and the larger the difference in the partial pressure of gas is that the basically the quicker it flows, the, the quicker it's transported, the quicker that it, it uh, maneuvers itself, if you will, uh, from an area of high pressure to low pressure. And what's interesting is that <clears throat> there are determining factors that um, have an effect on the overall concentration and essentially, I guess we call it the rate at which oxygen is delivered at the cellular level. The mitochondria, which are these little energy factories inside our cells, are very attuned to the presence of oxygen, and they're also very efficient at their, their particular activity um, with very, very small amounts of oxygen. Matter of fact, the mitochondria receive about 0.3% of inhaled oxygen at the lung level. So we don't need a lot of oxygen in order to really prime those mitochondria or activate those mitochondria to do what they need to do, and that is essentially is creating that energy currency at the, at the cellular level that's so important for our overall health, our brain function, our heart, our immune system, et cetera. 
So there's a, a few important concepts here with respect to oxygen levels in the body. We have one of the things that if, as, if we're just breathing room air, okay, at sea level, um, <clears throat> one of the limiting factors is the amount of hemoglobin that's actually found within the red blood cells. So the hemoglobin is what binds oxygen, and then the red blood cell is being transported throughout the bloodstream and delivering that oxygen down to the, at the cellular level. When we actually uh, are pressurizing or we use pressurized oxygen, we can actually achieve a much higher concentration in the body because essentially what's happening is the partial pressure of oxygen is being increased because of the pressure chamber that <clears throat> the plasma, the interstitial fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid becomes super saturated in oxygen, essentially independent of the level of hemoglobin that is in within our red blood cells. So we're able to move past the binding capacity of the hemoglobin and just super saturate the body fluids essentially. So the body really just becomes bathed in oxygen uh, and even areas that are deprived of oxygen that may have been deprived for a long, long time can receive benefit by increasing cellular metabolism. And that's what we find happening neurologically and, uh, you know, especially in autism as well. All right. <clears throat> so hyperbaric oxygen therapy traditionally is known in, in, a, in a scenario where we're inhaling um, up to 100% oxygen in a pressurized system, so i.e. our chamber, that is what's called greater than one atmosphere absolute, okay, one atmosphere pressure. Now, and we talk about most of the inflatable chambers, and we'll show some pictures of those later here. Um, they go to what's called 1.3 atmospheres, which is equivalent approximately to about 10 feet below sea level. So if you were to think about going into a pool, uh, and you went down about 10 feet, maybe 9, 10 feet or so, you're about 1.3 atmospheres pressure. Um, the 1.5 atmosphere pressure, absolute uh, chambers, you're about 16 feet below sea level or so. Okay, so there's a, a marked difference actually between 1.3 to 1.5. Now, Dr. Newbrander, uh, we know Dr. Newbrander from his work with methyl B12, methyl B12 injection therapy. Well, he also has brought um, a lot of information, clinical experience, with respect to hyperbaric, particularly using the inflatable chambers, the 1.3 chambers, um, with kids on the spectrum. And, and his, his definition essentially is the inhalation of hyperbaric, his definition of hyperbaric, um, and sort of in quotes, it's not exact, but <clears throat> the inhalation of varying degrees of oxygen um, essentially at greater than one atmosphere absolute. So where the traditional model for hyperbaric was, you know, inhaling up to 100%, new brand is feeling as well, maybe we can modify that and say varying degrees of oxygen. So we don't have to be at 100% in order to get our classic definition of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So what are some of the determining factors involved in the effectiveness of HBOT? Well, of course, the oxygen concentration, that's one variable, that's one factor. The pressure effects, the different types of pressures that we're using, meaning the different types of pressures in the different chambers. And time, the higher pressures in a higher oxygen concentration generally leaves less, uh, you know, less time is allowable in the chamber, while lower pressures and lower oxygen concentrations many times allows for longer treatment times in a chamber. And we'll, we'll talk about that here when we talk about some protocols. Okay. Uh, what are some, what types of conditions is HBOT commonly used for? Well, the traditional use, now this is basically set up um, by the Underseen Hyperbaric Medical Society based on reimbursement purposes from insurance many times, um, you know, with very restricted uses for hyperbaric in the quote-unquote traditional medical community. So the traditional medical community has generally seen hyperbaric oxygen therapy but, uh, as far as having a very short range of disorders that it agrees to treat. Uh, and most of this, by the way, would be 
a chamber attached to a hospital, for example. Okay, air and gas embolism, carbon monoxide poisoning, crush injuries, decompression sickness, uh, very well known in deep sea divers. Um, healing of selected wounds, skin grafts, burns, gangrene, um, major blood loss. That kind of makes sense, right? If you lose a lot of blood, um, you want to get the oxygen levels up in the body and up in the brain, so put a person in a chamber and you don't have to worry so much about the hemoglobin concentration. Cranial abscesses, radiation injury, etc. So you can see that this list is, is pretty short um, and pretty narrow. Now, many of these conditions often require higher pressures of oxygen, sometimes greater than two atmospheres absolute, um, much higher than what is typically used um, for kids on the spectrum with respect to treatment. Now, <clears throat> what are some other things that are, hyperbaric is now being used for? Sort of what's called off-label use. Well, of course, autism or autism spectrum Generally, we're looking at 1.3 to 1.5 atmospheres absolute, so uh, many times the soft inflatable chambers, sometimes hard shell chambers. Um, it's been used in ADD, ADHD, different types of autoimmune disorders, inflammatory bowel disease, arthritis, etc. Um, it's been used in Lyme disease. Um, there is some literature out there and viewpoint within the Lyme community that you want to use hyperbaric cautiously in somebody who might have what's called a Babesia infection, which is a co-infection of Lyme. Um, but hyperbaric has also been used for people with lung infections, particularly fungal infections, migraine stroke, traumatic brain injury. Um, and that's a, that's a big one, the traumatic brain injury. That's getting a lot more uh, play now in the medical community. Um, in fact, I uh, have consulted with a, uh, a hyperbaric clinic up in Sacramento, California that uh, does a lot of hyperbaric oxygen um, treatment for individuals with traumatic brain injury. So that's an emerging area uh, and in incredible benefits can be seen with that. Okay, so the question then is, how do you know whether to do HBOT with your child? Well, you know, is there a test, for example, a blood test or a urine test or a hair test that would say, yeah, it looks good to do HBOT or no, it's not going to help. Um, there is no test. There is no lab test that you could do that would dictate yes or no whether to do hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The general consensus within the biomedical community, um, and this is really my feeling too, is that hyperbaric oxygen therapy is very beneficial for individuals with autism. It's clearly beneficial for a lot of other people too, but we're talking about autism. So it, it's definitely beneficial for individuals on the autism spectrum. Um, so it, it has a usefulness, and we could make a blanket statement to say it has the potential to help all individuals on the autism spectrum. Um, there's that potential they can get benefit. Like many things in biomedicine for autism, and honestly in, in medicine in general, doing a clinical trial or a treatment trial is warranted as far as as far as my experience. Um, now, does that mean that you immediately right now want to run out and put your child in a hyperbaric chamber um, without doing some of the other preliminary things first? And my recommendation is no. New to biomedical intervention, you don't want to just first start off with HBOT, from my experience. You really want to do some of the preliminary things first. Work on diet. Assess their digestive function. Make sure there's not yeast and bacterial imbalances. Make sure your child is on a good supplement program. Basically, building up their body and removing other uh, factors that might inhibit hyperbaric from working. Okay? That doesn't mean it has to take two years to do that, um, but it means it could be two or three months of implementing some other types of things, um, other therapies to have those on board before you do HBOT. In many cases, when you do that, kids are less reactive, um, and their overall response is improved. Okay, so <clears throat> we ask the question then: Is doing a clinical trial warranted? Um, I say yes, and the and there's a couple reasons for that. Right, the hyperbaric is known to decrease inflammation, and hyperbaric also helps to improve oxygen metabolism and the other many wonderful benefits that can come about from that, okay? 
Now, there's an excellent review article that I highly recommend that you just Google, uh, and it's titled Review of the Pathophysiology of Autism and Possible Benefits of Hyperbaric Oxygen Therapy. And the next few slides are based on this excellent article from Dr. Rosendahl. Okay, so brain hypoperfusion and autism. Hypoperfusion is decreased blood flow through an organ. Hyperperfusion of the brain is decreased blood flow through the brain or regions of the brain. Now, there are certain studies that have indicated upwards of 86% of autistic individuals show evidence of brain hypoperfusion, um, and it typically gets worse with age. So a young child is going to have more perfusion versus an older, uh, an older individual, typically. Okay. In addition, the decreased blood flow to various areas of the brain often correlates with some of the core autistic symptoms. Now, in a couple of months, I'm going to be doing a presentation on looking anatomically from a neuroanatomical and a neurophysiological standpoint with respect to what areas in the brain are often affected in autism and what sort of clinical symptoms can appear because of that. This is just a short list. The thalamus. Okay, often when that area is not being perfused or there's damage, we see a lot of repetitive behavior, what we often know as self-stimming. Temporal lobes. Temporal lobes are on the side of the head, sort of where your ear is. Um, and when those areas aren't getting perfused effectively, we see sameness, routine behavior, communication issues. Wernicke and, Bro and, and Brodman areas are areas in the brain, particularly on the left side of the um, left side of the parietal lobe that are, and also on the temporal lobe, that are involved in auditory processing and language, um, and we see, when those are damaged anyway, we see auditory processing problems and language development issues. Okay, so that's just a short list, and again, in a couple months I'll, I'll be able to really expand on this, um, but often when those areas are affected, not getting the blood flow, there's inflammation, whatever it may be, we see some of the core autistic symptoms. <clears throat> well, what happens in a person when, an individual on the autism spectrum, when their brain is being engaged, when they actually need to foster, you know, some, some, uh, some skills or their brain needs to respond in the moment? Well, in autism, um, I need to fix the slide here. Some autistic individuals actually show a decrease in blood flow um, to the brain when the brain is under demand, okay? So if they have to focus, the areas of focusing actually many times show a decrease in blood flow. When they're being prompted to speak, the areas of language processing often aren't getting the blood flow, okay, the, the temporal lobes, etc. So there's actually evidence where blood flow is decreasing, where in other individuals it's actually increasing um, just like it should. So what explains it? Well, there may be um, inappropriate vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction was where the blood vessels are constricting prematurely or constricting too much. And this certainly could explain um, one of the reasons we're not getting blood flow because the blood vessels constricting, you're not getting blood, blood supply to those areas. Essentially what happens is, is over time this leads to hypoxia. Hypoxia is the reduction of oxygen supply to tissues. Um, and then of course you can see where that would lead. It's just inefficient oxygen at the cellular level. <clears throat> what was interesting is that there's been some studies looking at two different markers uh, in the body. One is called BCL2 and P53. Um, essentially a reduction in BCL2 and an increase in P53 is found in some cases of autism. When P, uh, P53, I should have said P53, goes up, um, it's bas basically going up because of hypoxia, uh, a reduction in oxygen supply to tissues. And when BCL2 is, de uh, is decreasing, it's decreasing because of cellular death in those areas. So <clears throat> those were just some research um, reference ranges that were used uh, and something that Dr. Rosenthal had talked about in his paper. So again, I would highly recommend you know, looking at that paper um, for more detailed information. Well, where does all this lead us? 
Okay. Well, we end up, when we have hypoxia and we have cellular damage or death, we generally end up with neuroinflammation. And we have the blood-brain barrier, which is the cells that are surrounding the blood vessels. Um, <clears throat> and when we get inflammatory reactions in the brain, we get a, sometimes a damage of the blood-brain barrier, and we also then get damage of the nerve cells themselves. And we know that neuroinflammation is a big area in autism. It's getting much more research now, too. Uh, and it's an area that I've been involved in now for quite some time. And hyperbaric oxygen therapy is one of those things that can actually help quite significantly with neuroinflammation. Well, there's two major cells that we want to talk about here. One is called astroglia, and the next is microglia. Astroglia um, and microglia have very interesting properties. The astroglia really help with the overall physical support of the brain. They help support the blood, blood, the blood brain barrier. They're involved in nutrient support in the brain. And microglia are what tend to become what are called chronically activated, what's called microglia activation. They're the main immune defense in the brain. Um, they're constantly on the prowl. They're, they're essentially there to help look for invading pathogens to try to neutralize those pathogens. When there is a pathogen of some sort um, or there's some type of toxic insult, microglia become activated, and part of their activation is to trigger an inflammatory response. So whether, whether it's a virus, a bacteria, a toxin, whatever it may be, we're getting some microglia activation and we're getting some what should be some acute inflammation um, that helps to bring in some of the repair mechanisms, et cetera, um, and then the inflammation should go away once the microglia activation is turned off. The problem in autism commonly is that microglia activation isn't turned off. It, these microglia basically stay chronically turned on. So whether we're talking about some type of inflammatory trigger, um, lipopolysaccharide from a bacterial infection, um, triggering microglia activation, we get a whole cascade of pro-inflammatory cytokines that cause cellular damage, or we have a direct neurotoxic insult from a chemical, um, a vaccine reaction, um, some endogenous type of toxin, okay, something being created in the body, causing direct damage to the, to the nerve cells. Again, we get microglia activation, and we get what's called reactive microgliosis, and this is a self-perpetuating neurotoxicity event. Uh, and this has been documented in autism. Matter of fact, um, there's a, a lot of research studies out there and more being done. Um, this was one uh, from 2005 that um, came out of John Hopkins um, University where they looked at neuroglia activation and neuroinflammation in the brain of patients with autism. And essentially what the end result of this study was, was that they were finding was that the, the neuroimmune reactions were playing a pathogenic role in the individuals that they studied, um, and there was a significant proportion of autistic individuals who had this microglia activation occurring. And what they're talking about is that for future treatments in autism, we really should be looking at therapies that help to modify um, this type of neuroinflammatory reaction. <clears throat> And then, you know, this is just another study here looking at microglia injury and inflammation. Um, and again, this is just confirming that microglia and astroglia activation in autism is present um, and that this is causing cellular damage within the brain. There's a, a very good organization I would encourage you to look into. Um, it's called Stop Calling It Autism. Um, at stopcallingitautism.org, and their, their whole approach is really trying to answer the question of what's causing microglia activation, what's triggering inflammation in the brain um, of kids on the autism spectrum, and what can be done about it, okay? Um, and various testing that can be done through standard labs to try to, you know, indicate the potential for viral infections or immune deficiencies, and then working through a series of different types of treatments that can be helpful. And this is an organization that, um, that I am working with um, and have actually implemented <clears throat> much of the treatments now over the past number of years. So 
I would encourage you to go to this website. Um, very well laid out. Uh, the, the individuals are very well meaning and, and I think have done a have done a nice job and are doing a nice service for the autism community. Okay. So what are some other issues? What are some other things that can be helped potentially with hyperbaric oxygen therapy? One is gastrointestinal inflammation. Um, <clears throat> we know from the work of Dr. Wakefield and others, Dr. Arthur Prigsman in Austin, Texas, who does a lot of um, uh, assistance for kids on the spectrum by looking at factors with respect to inflammatory bowel disease. Um, we see a lot of kids get benefit from bowel inflammation when they're doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So um, we clearly know that inflammation can be helped. Uh, there's another effect that may be happening with kids in the spectrum too who have a lot of dysbiosis is the oxygen having a positive effect at reducing yeast and anaerobic bacteria. So uh, again, bowel inflammation is certainly one of those things that can be helped. The other thing is, is, is looking at cerebral hyperperfusion from an imaging study standpoint. Excuse me one second. Okay, excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, and that is doing something called spec scanning that can look at the metabody in the brain. And I'll show some images of that here. So if we're thinking about intestinal inflammation, on the left side we've got a normal colon, uh, a normal looking bowel. On the right side we've got a lot of inflammation. And I actually have presentations that really go through this in great detail about what exactly is happening in a wide variety of kids on the spectrum who continue to have chronic bowel problems. Many of them truly do have an inflammatory disorder. So a SPECT scanner is a, an imaging scanner. kind of looks like a, a CT scanner. There's different varieties here. We have this one here. And there's different varieties, different models. And some of the images that come up, um, this is actually from a clinic here in Southern California called Recovery Hyperbarics. Um, and this is just a spec scan looking at a 17-year-old autistic male prior to receiving um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And after a series of treatments, we can see how things are blue and cold. Um, we can start to see an improvement um, in those areas. <clears throat> right here, this little finger-like projection is the temporal lobe, and we have the prefrontal cortex um, here as well, and the occipital cortex in the back. So we can see a significant change just by doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Now, one of the other things we're often talking about at the cellular level is cellular damage and <clears throat> things that actually cause the cells to become hyperexcitable. This would be things like glutamate um, and MSG and aspartame, um, things that cause that hyperexcitability um, that leads to um, cell damage and eventually cell death. We can also have ischemic events. A, a, a hypoxia causes ischemia, lack of blood flow leading to damage at the cellular level. Whenever the cells become damaged, we get an increase in reactive oxygen species, um, things that cause further damage. And all of these things can lead to mitochondrial damage at that cellular level. The problem with mitochondrial damage is that we affect the overall production of something called ATP. ATP is that energy currency that our body needs, and we produce a tremendous amount of ATP through mitochondrial activity. When you do an organic acid test from Great Plains Laboratory, for example, there's a section on there called the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle is actually found within the mitochondria, and it's this I look at it as sort of like a wheel. that It's just constantly spinning and churning out ATP, and then we get a tremendous more production of ATP as we move through the different cycles of mitochondrial metabolism. Again, remember, mitochondria are only receiving 0.3% approximately of inhaled oxygen at the lung level. 
So any increase in that, um, even the slight increase, is going to help overall with um, cellular metabolism. And in ATP, it's not just energy to say, well, my kid is hyper. It's energy that helps with brain function, for attention, for language, for processing, for awareness. Energy for heart function, for immune function, for digestive and liver function, kidney function, muscle growth, etc. Our body needs energy um, through ATP production in order to do what it needs to do. Now, there's a couple different um, examples of different types of chambers. So let's talk about that here. This is just a, a, a an old picture I found that was essentially a, a, a kind of a prehistoric looking chamber that would have been used for a diving injury. Um, so somebody who may, uh, somebody who had a um, what they call the bends. So somebody who does deep sea diving. Um, the more modern chambers are much more kid and parent friendly. And this is just a father and son actually sitting in a hard shell chamber. We've got these window portholes here. Um, oftentimes these chambers will have, you know, like a TV set or a child can watch a movie or something outside the chambers. And then we also have chambers where the, you can bring in electrical devices as well, okay? Uh, and these are just what are called hard shell chambers that are often found in a variety of different clinics around the country. Now these are examples of hard shell chambers found at the California Integrative Hyperbaric Center in Irvine, California. Uh, a center that's about an hour and a half of my practice. Um, really good, great people. They do a, a lot of good. They work with a lot of families from around the country and they help a lot of people. Um, the nice thing about these chambers is you can get varying degrees of pressure um, and you can actually bring um, <clears throat> uh, electronic devices inside because kids are actually wearing oxygen hoods for these particular chambers at this particular clinic. So this is a hood that a child would wear so that they're the one receiving the high level of oxygen. And when that's the case, you're not getting a lot of oxygen that's being dispersed inside the chamber, which makes it convenient um, for kids who to keep their attention um, so that they can focus on you know, something other than sitting inside this chamber for an hour. They can look at videos or, or whatever it may be. <clears throat> Some other chambers and some other clinics um, use what's called a Secrus chamber, which is a chamber that is dispensing oxygen throughout the chamber. Um, these are chambers that would often be used for burn victims, for example, or um, somebody who has had skin graft, um, you know, uh, burn injuries, or you need healing of wounds and whatnot. Um, and these would be chambers that would typically where you would typically not be bringing in electronic devices. So it depends on what you have in your area, um, what you have access to. The bottom line is there's a lot of different types of chambers, um, but the overall usefulness of the therapy with respect to autism is quite profound. And then we have a variety of different, what are called soft chambers, inflatable chambers. Uh, and there's different companies that dispense these. And these are things that typically people have in their home. Now, you do have some hyperbaric clinics that will actually have these inflatable chambers along with the hard shell chambers too, um, but these are off, you know, often these chambers are for sale or lease that you could bring into the home and do hyperbaric at home. You're not going to get the real high pressures that you would get with the hard shell chambers, um, and <clears throat> you typically, in using an oxygen concentrator, aren't going to be getting the 100% oxygen. Um, but you still can get a varying degree of oxygen based on Newgrinder's definition that is still useful. <clears throat> and this is an OxyHealth chamber, again, a very popular chamber um, that many people either will purchase or lease. And this is a chamber that typically will go to 1.3 atmospheres. The oxygen concentrators now are getting more sophisticated where they're actually able to, you know, increase the concentration that is delivered into the chamber. Um, some people through their doctors are getting oxygen tanks in the home. Um, I'm a little bit leery about that. I'm much more comfortable for in-home use using an oxygen concentrator and if we're using the 100% peer grade oxygen, for me personally, I would uh, I just assume leave that up to a clinic 
uh, to oversee the, the use of the, the pure high-grade oxygen. But there are people out there that, um, that do that. Okay. <clears throat> Often with the oxygen concentrators, you know, you're getting a varying degree of oxygen concentration, many times, you know, 70% and greater. Um, and with the inflatable chambers at home, many times it's often best delivered through a mask. And this is actually an image here of a young child sitting in an inflatable chamber working on the laptop. And you can see they're wearing a mask. And you can't really see the tube, but there's a, there it is. The tube is right there that would then be exiting the chamber and, and getting oxygen from an oxygen concentrator. Um, <clears throat> some kids don't like wearing the mask. It's not always easy. Um, but what we have found over time is that even though they may not wear the mask and the mask is just inside the chamber, um, we're still getting, you know, you're still getting some beneficial oxygen. Again, this is not 100% pure grade oxygen. This is oxygen concentration, so it's going to be less typically than 100%. Uh, and this has been very safe and very effective. People often ask, you know, can I use a inflatable chamber if I use pressurized oxygen? And, you know, the reality is, is it can be done. From my comfort level, um, I'm more comfortable in a situation where the, the pressurized oxygen is being used at a clinic. <clears throat> so that's just, that's, just my pre that's just my preference. <clears throat> okay, so the other question then is, is hyperbaric dangerous, uncomfortable, or painful? Actually, the contrary. It's very, many times very relaxing and comfortable. Inside the chamber, it's generally quiet. Um, it's a time for many kids to relax, and <clears throat> it's not something that is real stressful. At times, there can be some ear discomfort as the chamber is being pressurized, uh, and so they, the initial popping that can occur in trying to get a child to pop their ears or clear their ears, essentially, sometimes can be a little bit uncomfortable, um, basically similar to going up in an airplane. There may be some slight dizziness at first, maybe for a few minutes, Sometimes these inflatable chambers can get warm. So if you're doing one of these in-home programs at home and, <clears throat> you know, it's a, during the summer, they can get a bit warm. I've had parents who actually will put a bucket of ice inside the chamber um, or they'll have a, uh, they'll have like an electric fan, you know, where they, I forget what these things are called, but it, it sort of can blow, you know, cool air. Granted, you're going to get some condensation inside the chamber and certainly needs to be wiped down afterwards, but it, that has been helpful as keeping it somewhat cool. And I know there's some other uh, um, places that can actually pump cool air into the chamber too, so that's, an, that's another option as far as like an air conditioning type of unit. So what I would suggest is this, if you're looking to either lease or purchase a home chamber, talk to the company and see what, uh, what they have available to help keep the air cool inside the chamber. All right, so what are some complications? Um, <clears throat> complications with hyperbaric um, typically have to do with barotrauma, that is air becoming trapped in various spaces, in the ears, in the sinuses, in the lungs, in dental fillings. Um, <clears throat> not something that I have personally experienced with the low pressure um, therapy that we're doing with kids on the spectrum. Some people have experienced blurry vision. <clears throat> I've seen that in one older patient who was going to a clinic, uh, and they were doing you know, high pressure. I think it was above 2.2 atmospheres, and she started developing some blurry vision. Again, with the pressures that are used in autism, 1.3 generally to 1.5, I've not personally seen those kinds of issues. Um, <clears throat> and typically, the ear pressure can just be relieved by chewing on some gum or yawning. What's interesting about with kids on the spectrum, the number one side effect of hyperbaric, at least early on, is hyperactivity. Now that's something that I've seen common with other therapies. We see that with methyl B12 or certain supplement therapies or B vitamins. So hyperactivity 
um, you know, can be something that is that is brought on initially with hyperbaric, and that may simply be the fact that we're starting to turn on areas in the brain. We're, we're reigniting cellular metabolism. It's sort of like things are being activated in the brain that hadn't been activated before. All right, so my general recommendation with respect to hyperbaric and really before implementing hyperbaric, um, again, is doing those foundational things that we know already to be true and helpful in autism. Dietary intervention, gluten casein-free diet, low oxalate diet, specific carbohydrate diet, there's a wide variety of diets. But generally, dietary intervention is important. Methylation support. I'm a big fan of methyl B12 injection therapy. Antioxidant therapy. Looking for yeast and bacterial problems in the digestive tract. Trying to clean up some of the bowel problems, incorporating good supplementation, supporting methylation are all very important before just jumping headfirst into hyperbaric. And that's what I do. That's what I do in my clinics. Excuse me, what I do in my clinic and my consults is just really help parents to implement these things and create a program of success. Um, <clears throat> and again, a couple other things. Um, there is that controversy within the Lyme community that if there is a co-infection of Babesia, that you know it's been reported to be exacerbated by hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So if your child has been tested or is known to have Lyme, um, it's not a bad idea to do some co-infection testing um, to make sure that they, they don't have any evidence of Babesia. What about oxygen toxicity? Well, this is certainly a real issue. Oxygen toxicity is essentially getting harmful effects of, of breathing oxygen at elevated partial pressures. Um, what we call the oxygen toxicity syndrome. And it can result in lung, eye, central nervous system problems. <clears throat> um, in my experience, and people I've you know, talked to who do hyperbaric oxygen therapy quite often, this is not something that I have seen in the pressures that are used in autism, the 1.3 to 1.5. Um, and, and I I've been doing this a long time. I just haven't seen it, and honestly, I haven't heard about it. It's not to say that there's not a case out there where the child didn't do well with hyperbaric, but we're typically not at the pressures that are problematic. Um, in many cases, even with the 100% oxygens. Now, if you're doing an in-home chamber, an inflatable chamber, where you're using an oxygen concentrator, it, it's you're going to be hard pressed, honestly, to really see a problem with oxygen toxicity. So. Uh, again, it's just been my experience with this particular therapy. So I don't see this as a big problem in autism with the, with the pressure chambers that are being used. And this is just a research study that looked at um, <clears throat> some kids who had actually undergone hyperbaric oxygen therapy for what they had is they had some radiation, they had some bone problems that occurred from radiation therapy. And, you know, the therapy was, the, the hyperbaric oxygen therapy was, was prolonged, and what they found was that there really was no ill effects with these kids. Uh, and these kids were actually given once daily at two atmospheres for two hours. Now, these children were non-autistic, okay, so they were not on the autism spectrum. And the reason I feel that, you know, autistic kids are more sensitive to these therapies is because of all the various complications that they have, the digestive problems, the nutritional issues, the, the neurological inflammatory problems, their body chemistry and their brain is just much more sensitive to changes um, than let's say, you know, other kids with, without those issues. All right, well, so what are some of the benefits of hyperbaric? Well, um, a, very, a very good study back in 2007 by Dr. Rosendahl and, uh, and, and associates, what they found was, was that, you know, what you would expect, hyperbaric was helpful. Um, they were measuring specifically something called C-reactive protein, which is a marker of systemic inflammation in the body. And <clears throat> when C-reactive protein was elevated, there was a significant decrease, not only at 1.3, but at 1.5 atmospheres um, of of uh, hyperbaric pressure. So it's likely that part of the reason HBOT works is that 
the pressure, even at 1.3, has a diminishing effect on inflammation. Um, and, of course, with decreased inflammation, there's going to be an increased potential for blood flow to those areas of the brain that need it. Okay. Well, what else did Rosenbell find in their study? Improvements in language and speech were huge. In fact, it was uh, one of the number one things that was seen. <clears throat> Clarity of speech, complexity of speech, spontaneity of speech. It wasn't just a child saying one or two words. It was the fact that the clarity of how they spoke, the complexity of language that they used, and spontaneity of, of language were the things that really became manifest. Kids became less socially withdrawn, um, in, increased awareness of what was going on around them, less sensory, okay? They weren't as sensory uh, speaking. They became more motivated in their task. And a wide variety of other things can come about. Can we say, you know, by just looking at a child, what exactly is going to be helped and how it's going to manifest? Unfortunately, you can't. Um, but the things in red, okay, improved gross and fine motor skills, improved energy, language, and speech are the things that are typically seen. I guess we could say the things that are more commonly seen um, and things that you could certainly hope to see with your child. This is from an article by Dr. Newbrander, and what he was just listing here, a child um, starting in June of 2006, trying to write his name, it was just scribble. Um, and what, we got June, July, August, September, four months later, yeah, four months, um, we can see of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, he's now writing his, his, uh, his name uh, pretty clearly here. <clears throat> so if we think about what we've talked about, well, what are some other benefits that can happen? Well, improved mitochondrial function. That makes a lot of sense, right? We improve oxygen capacity into the mitochondria. Essentially, it's going to work better. Um, <clears throat> improved blood flow. The other thing about hyperbaric oxygen therapy is that when you when you increase oxygen concentration in the body over you know, a prolonged period of time, it's not just one time, but it's a series of treatments, then essentially what you're doing is you're spurring on the body to create new blood vessels. Um, that can happen in the heart, it can happen in the brain, it can happen throughout the body. Um, so, and that's a very good thing that can occur um, in the brain. Hyperbaric is known to increase stem cell production. Um, we have people who are traveling all over the world spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to get stem cell. Well, hyperbaric has been known to actually increase stem cell production naturally. Um, <clears throat> neurochemical production, we get an improvement in the efficiency of how things like dopamine and serotonin work, norepinephrine work in the brain and body. Um, increased and improved antioxidant capacity. The number one antioxidant that is depleted in kids on the spectrum is glutathione. Well, by improving cellular metabolism, by decreasing inflammation, by releasing pressure on all of these different biochemical systems, we can improve the chemical efficiency of things like methylation, of transulfuration, so that glutathione has a capacity to return to normal levels. <clears throat> the article I mentioned about Dr. Newbrander, um, I would encourage you uh, to, to locate on his website. Um, he also has done a lot of work, like Rosenthal has done, in bringing this information to the autism community. You can go to his website at drnewbrander.com, and there's articles, there's videos, and presentations about the usefulness of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So check that site out, too. All right, what about protocols? Well, there has been a standard within the medical community, within the autism community, of what are called 40 dives, okay, 40 treatment sessions. And <clears throat> this can be at 1.3, 1.5, with varying degrees of oxygen. The typical program initially for an inpatient clinic would be, or what's most common, would be 40 sessions, approximately 60 minutes per session, 
at 1.5 atmosphere absolute with 100% oxygen, usually administered through an oxygen hood, if that's the type of chamber they have. Sometimes if there's no hood, it's just oxygen throughout the chamber. Um, about four to five times per week over a eight to ten week period of time. Okay, that's average. Now that's going to change depending on where you live and how much time you have and, and whatnot. But that would sort of be the average way of approaching it. Many times we talk about um, repeating a series of 40 and you know doing so four to six, maybe six to eight weeks um, later getting a break because breaks are important when it comes to hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Many times when you take a break, it allows for the brain, it allows for the cells, it allows for the mitochondria to kind of catch up, to adapt and change. Um, you know, the whole thing about working out is if you do the same thing over and over again, your muscles get used to the same activity. And so the whole thing about changing it up, you know, someday you do weight, someday you do cardio, someday you do stretching, someday you do yoga, someday you do plyo, and you are constantly changing it around so that your body doesn't get used to it. Same type of thing with these types of treatments, particularly something like hyperbaric. You do a series of treatments, take a break, do it again, take a break, and that can continue. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so that typical 40 is very common. In my experience with the majority of individuals who do hyperbaric, <clears throat> When are you going to start to see a clinical response? When do you know that it might start working? And it's very individualized, like a lot of things. But um, in most kids, we start to see positive changes, you know, between 15 to 20 sessions. Okay, so that would typically be, you know, 15 to 20 hours. Now, that doesn't mean it can't happen earlier than that. I've seen kids at five sessions start to, start to do extremely well, improve cognition, behavior, etc. Um, approximately 80% of kids, in my experience, in my practice, who've done hyperbaric in clinics at home, etc., um, generally start to respond um, within 40 sessions. And <clears throat> about 5 to 10% don't really show much clinical response. But I, I want to I wanna encourage you to not give up. Um, sometimes kids may need another 40, um, whether you're doing a soft chamber program or hard chamber program um, in a clinic. And I've seen kids where the parents just kept pursuing hyperbaric, um, took longer, but they finally started getting good results, speech and whatnot started coming about. Because it, it's complicated, it's very difficult to just look at a child and know exactly how they're going to respond to this type of treatment. <clears throat> now, there are some maintenance sessions that can occur with hyperbaric therapy. And, um, you know, once you've gone through your, your treatment series, for example, um, let's say you do 40 sessions and then you take a six to eight week break and you come back and do another 40 sessions, well, you can then do maintenance therapy. And I've seen, and it all depends on your location to a clinic, for example. You know, maybe where you do one hour every 10 to 14 days, you know, at 1.5 atmospheres, 100% oxygen. Or you do one to two hour sessions every 10 to 14 days using a soft chamber at home. Um, some people will come back if they live at a distance. They'll come, uh, they'll come back once a year and do 20 to 40 sessions, you know, in uh, a two to three week period of time. Okay, so there's a lot of ways of doing it. And the theory basically behind maintenance is, is again you're trying to overcome or overcome adaptation and the premise between hyperbaric is can you spur on further neurological development and neurological healing by repeating the oxygen therapies and in many cases you can. Okay I know there's a lot of information here on these slides but I'm just kind of trying to go through it you know, kind of slowly here so you can kind of get the gist of what I'm talking about. There is a daily program um, that has been implemented. And <clears throat> what this is, is this only works if you have a chamber at home. So you either have to lease a chamber or own a chamber that you would do at home. 
And this is using what's called mild hyperbaric, um, the soft chamber, the inflatable chambers that, that inflate to 1.3 atmospheres. Uh, and again, varying degrees of oxygen because you're using an oxygen concentrator. This is not according you know, to using pressurized oxygen at 100%, although I realize that some people do that. Okay. <clears throat> so what this is, and a lot of this was actually established by Dr. Newbrander and his clinical experience in, in implementing hyperbaric. But the goal is, is you're trying to maximize hyperbaric oxygen treatment through an in-home program in a 30-day period of time where you're getting about 75 to 90 session, uh, uh, 75 to 90 sessions in a month. Um, and the way you do that is, you know, doing it, you know, 1 to 1 1.5 hours twice a day for 30 days. Now, remember at the beginning of the presentation when I said, you can generally stay in a hyperbaric chamber for a longer period of time when you're using less pressure and less oxygen. That doesn't mean it's less benefit. It's just you generally can stay in that chamber for a lot longer period of time. Now, granted, with most kids, they're going to get pretty intolerable after an hour and a half. So you need to get them out just because they're kids. They don't want to be cooped up. But this is one way of doing a, a a treatment trial, a diagnostic month with respects to hyperbaric oxygen therapy in home. Okay. <clears throat> now, there is definitely some evidence that kids may get benefit by doing both, doing an in-home program with soft or inflatable chamber hyperbaric, and then doing a clinic-based program. Um, there could certainly be a difference in the neuroinflammatory effects. And certainly, remember the adaptation effect, um, challenging the body, challenging the brain to adapt, to change, to grow um, in different ways. And the way that you could achieve that is by doing soft and hard shell chamber over a period of time. Um, <clears throat> there certainly is some evidence that there may be a plateauing effect that occurs with soft chamber. And where you may just feel like you keep doing the soft chamber over and over and over again. Maybe you do it for 30 days. You take a, a two to three week break. You come back. You do another again for 30 days, and you repeat that cycle. And you just feel like your child has plateaued. If you feel like you're reaching a plateau effect, then that may be a good indication at that time to go to a clinic and have um, chain, uh, hyperbaric through a hard shell with a higher degree of pressure and a higher degree of um, oxygen therapy. Again, most of this works is when you're working with a physician um, who can help guide this whole process. Now, I've had a couple case reports that were interesting. Uh, and this was parents who basically own a chamber, and they just stuck with it. They just were, were dedicated to the process. Um, they don't have hyperbaric clinics close by. Um, they don't have the funds to be traveling and be away for two to three weeks at a time. Um, and so they're limited by their location. But they have a chamber at home. They've just dedicated themselves to saying, you know what, we're just going to stick it out. Uh, and a couple of these kids, it took a long time. Matter of fact, um, there's uh, one case where they needed to get up, get up well over 100 treatment hours in the chamber before language emerged, but it's finally started to emerge and finally started to come about. And it was the patience and persistence that was key. If they had given up after a couple months, given up at 60 hours or 90 hours, they wouldn't have seen the benefit. Um, <clears throat> so it's very common for kids with these therapies to show benefit over time. And so you've got to be patient and I know I know it's a hard thing, but it's, it's that patience and persistence that's key. Okay, one word of caution here. Some people try to outfit their inflatable home chambers, which the manufacturer says, you know, it only goes above 1.3, and they try to outfit it to go higher, okay? It's not advised. Um, there have been cases of chambers exploding. Um, if you start to modify your chamber, then you're basically going against what the manufacturer regulations were for that chamber, 
and you increasing the risk of injury for you and your child. So uh, the recommendation is don't do that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> All right, and so that that's that's just real important. That, that's just really key. All right, so let's break this down. What are some pros and cons? In home versus clinic based hyperbaric. In home, you can either rent or buy. Um, this may be a more affordable way for you to start. Okay, what are some what are some pros to that? Well, more flexibility in time. Okay, you're not having to get in the car, you're not having to travel someplace, you're at home, you, you know where your child is, you can watch them, you're, you're sort of involved in the process. Um, you can get more hours in the chamber in a less amount of time. Okay, and I know how, you know, stressed time is, you know, particularly with busy families. You're in a relaxed environment, it's not to say that clinics aren't relaxed, but there's nothing like being at home. Okay, the travel of time or expense, it's pretty obvious what, what are some of the benefits. Um, some people can get an insurance deduction. Some people have medical spending accounts that they can put towards purchasing or leasing of a hyperbaric unit. In many cases, you can your child can bring in a game player, a DVD allowable inside these inflatable chambers. With some clinics, they won't allow you to bring in those devices. Well, what are some of the pros of a clinic? Um, you definitely have more flexibility with with chamber pressure. Remember the inflatables generally will go up to 1.3. There's a few of them that will go to 1.5. But in the clinic, they can have a variety of different pressures. They can even go higher if needed. You get the higher oxygen concentration. Um, you don't have to store it. You don't have to learn how to use the equipment. Okay, so you basically go to a place, they handle it, and you're done. Um, you get professional assistance. You get somebody overseeing the therapy. Um, and you may get some insurance deduction for that. Uh, you're going to be hard pressed to get insurance to pay for it, but you may get, I should say actually a tax deduction, not insurance deduction. That's, that's really what I should actually put here, um, not an insurance deduction. Okay, well, <clears throat> what about some of the cons of in-home versus clinic? Well, again, the in-home, you're limited by pressure. Okay, so you can only go as high as the chamber will go. Oxygen concentration, you're getting varying degrees of oxygen. It's still high, but it's not the 100% pure grade that you get through a clinic. Um, generally, to rent, it's fairly inexpensive, but that's variable for everybody's budget. To purchase, it can vary. It can be anywhere from 4000 to 15000 depending if you get a used unit, if you're buying a new one, how big it is. Okay, So there's a variety of pricing. Um, the cons are you got to learn how to use it. You got to learn how to set it up, um, and you're having to oversee the treatments at home. Okay, uh, as I mentioned before, you're, there's just limited or no insurance coverage for hyperbaric, particularly for autism. One of the other challenges with in-home is anxiety of your child. And I've had one parent who actually bought a chamber, and at that time, this was a I can't remember how many years ago it was but their kid would not get in the chamber. And it created a tremendous amount of stress in the family um, because father was looking at this chamber sitting in the living room in the corner, and he's making monthly payments on this thing, um, and they just they couldn't do it. It created a, a tremendous divide between mom and dad. They both wanted it to work, but the reality was, was that ch their child had just so much anxiety. Okay, <clears throat> So that's something to consider. Some of the uh, cons of a clinic, it can be expensive, $100 to $200 per treatment, um, $125, $150 bucks per a hyperbaric treatment, depending on the clinic. Uh, again, limited no insurance coverage, same thing with the in-home. It's time intensive, travel expense, scheduling conflicts, you know, the usual stuff. Um, some hard shell chamber clinics don't allow you to take in these video game devices, so that's something to be aware of. Some of them require the child to wear a hood. Um, you got to check with the clinic whether they do hooded hyperbaric or not. And so that's there's a learning curve to that. Child needing to get over the anxiety, etc. Uh, but it's not impossible. All right. So <clears throat> that gives you a little bit of an overview of some of the pros and cons of, of HBOT, uh, of in-home versus clinic. Well, there are some basic supplement support. 
course, you know, with people I'm working in my practice, you know, we've gone through a series of things. We've looked at digestive function, etc. But this is just a short list. In essence, if, if you were to look at something that I would minimally have a child on going to hyperbaric therapy, I'd want to be on some B vitamins, uh, a multivitamin. Basic Nutrients Plus is a great vitamin for new beginnings, nutritionals. Uh, antioxidant of some sort, you know, to just lessen the potential for oxidative stress. CoQ10 is certainly worthwhile. It helps with mitochondrial function like the oxygen does. Um, I love liposuchal glutathione, or what's called liposomal glutathione. We know that glutathione is, is often deficient in autism. Many kids respond quite well to liposuchal or liposomal glutathione. Again, available from new beginnings. Um, very, very useful. So this is a, a basic supplement program. And other doctors may have other things they use, but this is typically what, what I have used. Okay, so what's the bottom line? <clears throat> Hyperbaric, like any therapy in autism, is not a magic bullet. Um, I know I've presented a lot of information tonight. It's a wonderful therapy. I don't want to make it sound like it's a magic bullet therapy for autism. But it can be extremely helpful. Um, in some kids. Um, in my experience, it's been very safe um, at the pressure levels that are used. Um, <clears throat> it's non-painful, non-traumatic. And I really think it's a must-try therapy at some point for your child. Uh, and that's, again, my, my, apparent, my opinion, my experience. Um, <clears throat> in the ideal world, okay, it would be great to have every family who is going to go down the path of hyperbaric to actually be able to do an in-home program first. So you, you, have a, 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 you have a chamber for a month or two, and you're actually able to go through the process of doing it twice a day um, to see how your child does, et cetera, et cetera, um, and go through that type of program. And then go to a clinic where you have hard shell chamber done at a higher oxygen concentration. And then at the end of that, and that could be six months or nine months, see what kind of benefits we're seeing. That would be the ideal, and I realize that doesn't always happen, but I have a few people in my practice who've been able to make that happen. Um, what I want you to be aware of is that no matter what you choose and, and what you have available to you and the money you have and the budget and whatnot, um, whether it's hard shell, whether it's inflatable, <clears throat> hyperbaric therapy as a therapy in general has been very helpful and continues to be very helpful um, for kids on the autism spectrum. And that's not just kids. That's also teenagers and adults as well. There is a group that I have referred people to um, called Healing Dives, and they are a leasing company. You can also lease to own through them as well. And they ship all over the world, and uh, very nice people, and they provide a very nice service. Uh, I know there's other services out there, and this is just one that I've had experience with. So you can go to healingguys.com, look through their information, call them up, talk to them, find out you know, what they have available, uh, and how you can actually acquire uh, a chamber to do at home. Okay. I know I presented a lot of information tonight, and I appreciate you hanging with me. Um, this presentation, I'm actually going back now. I've got about three or four years' worth of material that I've created ever since I started doing these presentations. Um, I'm going back and updating presentations over the past couple of weeks that I will be making available in mass through uh, a website I have called Biomedical University. Um, and what I'm doing with these presentations is converting them into a PDF, but they're PDF color, so it's not black and white. Um, <clears throat> and then right now, for this particular presentation, um, I'm making available through my office. So if you, if you want to email, you can email my office at info at mysunrisecenter.com, and we're selling them for $15. And that just kind of helps to, with some of the overhead costs and, and whatnot that go into making these things and handling them. Um, and then, and like I said, in the future, I'll be sending out a notice once I'm able to get, the, we have the website, but it's not 
completely set up yet to be able to download these things. So uh, I just wanted to make you all aware that I realized that particularly this presentation, because there's so much to it, that if you'd like to get a copy of it, um, you can email Brittany at my office, and, um, and we can get you set up and get you get you uh, a converted copy. Um, a few of the images will be deleted. Uh, I realize as I go through this, I, I saw a few things I need to change, and so I'll do that tonight. So there'll be an updated version you know, tomorrow for you. So um, <clears throat> again, if you had posted some questions, I will uh, I'll be able to answer those once I get those from Great Plains. And, uh, and get those back to you on email. I'm also available for consultations. I do office consults. Um, I do phone and I do Skype you know, consultations as well. So I work with people all over the world. Um, as an FYI, I am expanding my practice beyond just Southern California physically. Um, I'm actually uh, in... <clears throat> talks with a hyperbaric clinic up in Sacramento. Um, so I'm actually looking to, you know, I will be, not looking to, I will be actually expanding my service up to Central California, um, the Sacramento area, and then uh, in time here, hopefully over the summer, up into Oregon as well. So I'm looking to really expand uh, people being able to see me uh, and have access to me, you know, all the way through California and up into Oregon. So. The next stop will be to start seeing patients up in Sacramento. So if you're in the Sacramento area, if you're in the Northern California area and you're listening uh, and you'd like to consult with me, contact Brittany at my office. I'm right now creating uh, an interest list. Um, and then once I get you know enough people that we can get scheduled, I'll be able to you know, fly up to Sacramento and start seeing people. So I'm hoping to do that in the next month. Um, sometime maybe mid to late February. So if that's something that is of interest to you, then uh, contact Brittany again at my office at 951-461-4800 uh, or you can go to info at mysunrisecenter.com for more information. <clears throat> okay. Everyone, I appreciate you joining me tonight. I hope you found this information useful. I always enjoy doing these webinars and I enjoy you know, presenting this information to you. And I will see you again in a month where we're going to be talking about neurological inflammation and get more in-depth about microglia activation. Uh, and that's going to be a, a real important uh, piece of information and uh, educational material that you want to tune into. Okay? We'll talk soon. Take care. Have a good month.